first of all, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming. Um, and most of you in this group can understand why this is such an important topic. And even if you're not of the same gender, I, I assume that you, you do too understand why it's an important topic. Whether you think that this is the year of the war on women or this is the year of the woman, it's a fascinating year. There's almost a record number, record breaking number of women running for Congress in, in the Senate. Um, we've seen a lot of issues that have been surfaced from the Republican primary about so called women's issues. And um, tonight, what we would like to do is just sort of talk about some of the issues that are bubbling throughout the campaign and also talk about, because of the, the nature of some of what the journalists on the panel cover, and also with Reshma here, who has personal experience as a candidate, um, we want to give, give you a sense of sort of what it's like on the trail for women and about women and how the media covers female candidates as well. Um, I, I'm going to like ha uh, allow each person to introduce themselves just briefly. And I have one surprise from the program. We dragged Ashley Parker off the Romney campaign bus where she's been stuck for months, but enjoying it. Um, she's, she's also a New York Times journalist. And so um, I'm going to go to Ashley first, and you can just say who you are and how long you've been here and what you're doing. OK, I'm Ashley Parker. Uh, I'm a reporter at the New York Times. I'm covering Romney. I've been covering him full time, basically on his bus and on planes. Um, since last August, uh, and before that, I started the time seven years ago as Maureen Dad's research assistant, and sort of had some different beats in between. And Karen Tamalti from the Washington Post is here. Hi. Uh, yeah, I've been at the Washington Post as national political correspondent for about two and a half years. Uh, before that, I was at Time Magazine for 15 years. Uh, the last, I don't know how many, uh, the last ten of those years it was as their national political correspondent. And uh, before that, the LA Times. And to my left is Reshma Shadani, who was formerly the deputy public advocate, right? And now runs a really cool uh, nonprofit called Girls Who Code. And um, you can finish your introduction yourself. <laughs> um, I am the founder of an organization called Girls Who Code, which is a national nonprofit that teaches teenage girls how to compute a program. Uh, our hopes is to teach 2 million young women in the next 20 years how to compute a program to, and to close this massive STEM gap that we have. Uh, I'm also currently exploring a run for public advocate uh, in 2013, and I'm writing a book called Women Who Don't Wait in Line, which uh, is going to be out <laughs> in, in May of 2013. And next in line we have Susan Solney, who has been at the Times for several years and is um, uh, no novice to campaigns, having been on the OA campaign trail on and off, on and off, and this year as well, covering people from Michelle, ba Michelle Bachman, excuse me, to Herman Cain, and now devotes a good deal of her time to covering various and different groups of voters, including young voters, women voters. She was most recently in North Carolina, looking at the black vote, whether it will turn out in the record numbers that it had turned out in the OA campaign. Her story, I believe, was up online today and, and in the paper. Um, I'm sorry, Susan, you can about it. <laughs> I apologize. I get a little... Uh, Thank you, though. <laughs> so welcome. And then all the way to the left, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to dip back and forth, is Alex Wagner from MSNBC. And Alex, I'll let you fill in the rest of your bio. Well, uh, I, I mean, maybe I should talk about Susan. Uh, <laughs> As you mentioned, I host now with Alex Wagner, me, uh, Monday to Friday at noon, noon to one on MSNBC. We are a politically focused show that is driven in large part by scintillating conversation um, and news of the day. I spend an inordinate amount of time reading stories by Karen, Ashley, and Susan um, as preparation for the show, and uh, we're deep in the 2012 horse race. We are. We are. And that's one of the things that we wanted to start off talking about tonight, and that is how critical is the women's vote this year. And um, Karen and I were talking a bit earlier about how we would define the gender gap and what it means for Obama this year, even as some of the polls are closing as we get toward the um, election day. So Karen, I wanted to ask you to talk a bit about where the numbers are right now and where they have been in the past. Sure. Uh, first of all, I think it's uh, important to know what exactly pollsters are talking about when they talk about a gender gap. Uh, it is not the difference between the percentage of men who are going to vote for a candidate compared to the percentage of women, but actually the percentage of the male 
the male and female vote between two candidates, meaning if, say, 51% of men voted for Barack Obama in, in 2008 in Virginia and 53% of women did, that's a 2% gender gap. So just so we kind of know how you define that. Um, but the Obama campaign is going into this election absolutely knowing that they're going to lose the male vote. And so the kind of rule of thumb that they are talking about is that they have got to win the women's vote by probably at least 53% of the women's vote to even have a chance to overcome what is going to be you know, a certain deficit among men. But what I was really struck by a, a few weeks ago, um, the women's vote is really, as you can imagine, crucial in these swing states. So I went down to Virginia. The, Virginia did not have the gender gap. That 51% versus 53%, that is how men versus women voted for Obama in Virginia in four years ago. Uh, we at the Washington Post polled Virginia about three weeks ago and found out that there is now a 25-point gender gap that Obama is leading among women by 19 percentage points, and he is losing among men by 6 percentage points. Um, but it's also important to know that the women's vote is not a monolith. Uh, Obama is actually losing among white women in Virginia. Where he is winning is, again, is with non-white women. Over 90% of non-white women are supporting him. There's also traditionally a big gap between how married women vote, which is much more Republican, than how single women vote. So it's, you know, again, I think we in the media make a little bit of a mistake, first of all, not defining what our terms mean when we talk about a gender gap, but also by treating the women's vote like it itself is a, um, you know, is a monolith. It's not. Thank you very much. So when we talk about the women's vote, um, Ashley, could you talk a little bit about how the Romney campaign has been trying to woo women to its side? Yeah, um, so a couple things. One thing you saw at the Romney campaign was they, uh, and this was during the primaries, uh, when they were having a little trouble against Newt Gingrich, they basically put Ann Romney out, and she didn't have any message that was really tailored to women other than, I'm a woman. Um, and so it's, un it's I mean, frankly unclear how effective that was. And then she began sort of talking about how she was hearing from all of these women, and you know they were telling her the economy matters, and that's what women voters care about, which dovetailed nicely with what Romney's message was. And I was just actually up in Boston uh, yesterday and today, meeting with people at Romney's headquarters, and I was talking to his pollster, and they were saying that even as sort of the debate hit and Romney has started to overcome, you know, just some of the lagging in polls, they said the one area he lags with still is women, and they said they thought the reason why was over issues of women's rights and contraceptive issues and stuff like that, and it's interesting because I'm on the trail all the time, we're all following the news, and you rarely hear that. Um, you don't hear Romney mention it in his stump speech, and I don't think you hear Obama mention it in his stump speech that much, but what the Obama campaign has realized is this is something that women care about. Obviously, they care about women's issues, they care about, you know, choice, and and so they have been sort of like micro-targeting. So you may not see it in a stump speech, but you know there's direct mail, and it's sort of directly targeting the women who are going to be most susceptible to, to that argument, and that's where Romney is still really lagging and struggling to overcome it. If I could just say that one thing I think that the Romney people, they'll always say, well, women entrepreneurs like Mitt Romney, women small business owners, women overall on the economy favor Barack Obama by double digits. So. I think this is one place where they have not defined themselves very well. This may have shifted, a lot of it has shifted, at least temporarily after the debate. Um, I, would, I would just add, in terms of women not being monolithic in the economic issue, um, Ron Brownstein in the National Journal had a great piece on quote unquote waitress moms, um, which is to say white working class women in swing states and how the Obama team has, as you said, Ashley, micro-targeted and whether it's 
through di direct mail or the ads that they're putting out there. I mean, there's this famous, infamous 47% uh, video that they have, and it has it has pictures of working white middle, you know, working working class women, and it's talking about how Mitt Romney sort of doesn't feel their pain. The other thing I would add to that is the issues of reproductive freedom and paying for contraceptives aren't so much sort of social issues for a lot of these working class women; they're economic issues, and that's I think where Obama is fi finding resonance with white working class women if he is finding uh, traction with them. Susan, when you've been out interviewing women in particular, I mean, which issues to them are most important? Well, first I've been struck by a, a reluctance to blame President Obama for their problems and an embrace of a larger role for government in their lives. I mean, if you think about, I focus on youth a lot, so I'm going to talk about what I know about single women, uh, particularly women with uh, young children. Uh, they're relying on things like school lunch and breakfast at some point, medical, uh, access to medical care. Um, some have been on Medicaid. I think we, did, we published a survey recently that showed that more than half of single women um, have relied on some form of government assistance in the past year. And their jobless numbers have almost doubled since the beginning of the recession. So there's a certain um, understanding that the government does play a role in lives. And I think that's why they're tilting more toward the Democrats than the Republicans. And there was that video that the Obama team was sort of much maligned for featuring, um, I can't remember her name, it wasn't Jane, but it was like, it showed the life of a woman in the United States right. and how the government sort of helped, gave her a leg up in many stages of her life. Now, the Republicans attack that as sort of government handouts and living cradle to grave um, on, on, on government subsidies, but it also was a testament to the, you know, the involvement of government in female lives in this country. The other reality is women earn less than men, save less than men as a result of that, and live longer than men. So they have to be more concerned about the long term and, and take, take care of their parents. parents. Mm -hmm. Take care of the parents. Take care of the kids. So why don't men like Obama? Why, why, why is Obama lagging when it comes to men? Um, I think because men see economic issues in a different frame. And also, you know, just traditionally going back at least as far as Ronald Reagan, which is when the term gender gap was first identified. Men just generally tilt Republican. I think they see national security issues through a different through a different lens often than women do. Um, and so it's just this is something that has been ingrained in our politics at least as far back as Ronald Reagan. And am I right to remember that, with the exception of like the 2010 midterm elections where Republicans did sort of garner more women, that women tend to vote Democratic anyway in like in modern history and maybe dating back beyond before Reagan, right? right. Yeah. So there is that sort of built in, uh, if you will, tilt for women as well. Um, in terms of, is Waitress Moms the new security mom? Is Waitress Moms the new, it's an odd term. I actually, I, I just prefer working class mom. Yeah. I mean, Waitress Moms, the house, that reminds me of Alice's Restaurant and Flo, which is my grits. <laughs> that was bad. I mean, I love that show, but uh, it, it, I don't know. I mean, you know, moms in general, women that care, that, that are dealing with household finances, that, as you said, know the cost of, you know, their, everything from their contraception to their kids' lunchables. Um, these are economic issues. It's interesting that in some of our polls we've seen that women tend to give Obama more of a sort of the benefit of the doubt when it comes to do you think his economic policies are working, do you think that they need more time to work, or that they'll never work. Men tend to say no, they'll never work, life sucks, let's move on. And women, the women I mean I'm talking about you know small percentages here, but more women than men generally say that they'd like to give the benefit of the doubt or that their lives are improving. And you're right, that they don't they don't blame Obama, whereas men are more likely to do so. Uh, in, in some polls, mind you, not in, not in every poll, and we're seeing a lot of fluctuation in the polls right now in the post-debate period and post last Friday's jobs report as well. So this week is kind of really interesting because it's a roller coaster ride with the polls, I think, um, in some of them. How was the Romney uh, campaign after the Pew poll yesterday, which had had gone from uh, three weeks ago, I think it was, Obama was up by eight, and yesterday Romney was up by four. Um, well, let's just say I got that poll emailed to me by a number of top Romney advisors. <laughs> um, 
So we're putting a lot of credence into it, but the big moment for the Romney campaign was obviously the, the debate. Um, and one thing was, you have to remember, they were coming off of two really, really bad weeks. Um, they had this Libya stumble, and then they had the 47% comment. And so when the debate happens, I, I was at the debate um, in Denver, and the thing that was most interesting to see was, I mean, they were all happy that Romney had won. They were excited about that, but in a way it was almost more than that. It was sort of this warm, sweet, even emotional moment because they felt like it was the first time that the world and sort of voters in America at large had seen their candidate the way they see him, which is someone who's strong and competitive, but also, you know, empathetic and warm and even funny. Like, they couldn't stop talking about, I don't know if you remember at the beginning of the debate, but Obama uh, wished Michelle a happy anniversary and then Romney actually made a very funny joke. And they were like, you know, can you believe that Romney was the funny one instead of Obama? And they were just so in awe that people were finally seeing him the way they saw him. It was very sweet. Susan, am I right? Were you with um, voters on, on debate night? I was. And so what were their impressions? Uh, they laughed at the Romney line, and the Obama line felt kind of flat. But I think the intention was to open it by calling out his sweetie and to you know, gain a few points there. But overall, um, their impression was that uh, Obama fell flat. I think it was the consensus that most people have reached. Right? And what was the mix in the room? I mean, were there mostly? Yeah, two men, two women. Uh -huh. And yeah. all <laughs> Obama Romney voters or uh, undecided? There were a couple of undecideds and the others were leading Obama. They weren't going to change their vote as a result of the performance, but they were disappointed. But I gotta, can I ask, was it felt, I mean, the media reaction of certainly some people, including myself, are implicated in this. <laughs> Today we were talking about this on the show. The president self-immolated. Yeah, like, this is a meltdown of nuclear proportions. It's like, gee, geez, he just like wasn't. I mean, he wasn't that good, but you know, setting himself on fire is a little bit extreme. <laughs> what you said, yes, that was more of their reaction. It's like, well, it was an off night for him. Everyone has a bad night. Let's move on. What's on next? You know. <laughs> I was surprised by the reaction beyond their living room, let's say. Rashma, we haven't let you talk yet. What was your impression? Um, yeah, I thought it was pretty clear from the beginning that Romney was just so much more energetic, right? And, and so much more, I think, in many ways connecting. We saw a very different man um, as you were watching the debate. And, you know, from what, from what I had heard from some folks, uh, uh, on the campaign was that, you know, during prep, the president was just having a really hard time not being like that wagging guy, right? He just so, he, he, you know, doesn't like Romney, right? And so the strategy, I think, was to um, to run out the clock. And 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 I think that there wasn't an expectation that the president was that Romney was actually going to move to the to the center. And I think that that took him by surprise. But they couldn't see that coming. Um, <laughs> But I, it reminded me, I mean, basically the president tried to phone it in. And it reminded me of, I moderated a panel on health care about six weeks after Barack Obama announced for president. And all the Democratic candidates were there. And it was sponsored, it was at a university in Las Vegas, it was sponsored by the Healthcare Workers Union. Uh, it was very clear that all the candidates were going to be put through their paces on health care. And I remember calling every single one of them seven Democratic candidates' campaigns. And the Obama campaign, I kept saying, you know, what's your plan, what's your plan? And they'd say, and sure enough, he got up on stage that day and tried to phone it in. And Hillary Clinton got on stage, and of course, she's just got it, you know, the health care issue, you know, wired into her chromosomes by this point. John Edwards had a very clear plan, and on top of it, it was that week that Elizabeth Edwards found out that her breast cancer had returned, so he got a big say. And Obama just crumpled on that stage, too. And so he, you know, he just is capable sometimes of deciding he... He's going to phone it in. And seven weeks after that, he had a very credible health care plan. And he ultimately, he staked his entire presidency on the health care issue. But this is just not a setting, I think, that he feels like people can push him into. And on the other hand, Romney has been through how many debates in the primaries? Like 20 something. Yeah, over, over 20. Plus, you know, when he was governor, he had debates when he was running for governor and also against Ted Kennedy long ago, too. So he's a very experienced debater, uh, whereas Obama has less experience and hasn't done it for four years. Either. And I think doesn't like it. 
Like, I think he wanted to have, and I appreciated this, I think he wanted to have a real conversation about the ideas and didn't want to have his three minute sound bite. He wanted to go out to dinner. <laughs> Where, he, where he's talking about his anniversary, it really does set the table for. I kind of would rather be in this state. Like yeah, I'm aware where 40 million people are not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, but it's a testament to how disengaged I think he was. Um, so, at any at any rate, um, do you think with the polls sort of tightening a bit right now, Ashley, I'm going to ask you this, and then we're going to move on to female candidates and covering uh, female, I mean, you know, women's campaigns, but. Um, do, can Romney, do you think he can make up a, enough ground with women, or are they still pushing sort of in Ohio, or have they given up altogether? Um, I mean, that, that's, 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 the, that's the question, right? Um, I mean, I think one thing, and this is not strictly with women, but what you're seeing is now that the polls are tightening and they feel like they have a shot. When they started running, they basically felt, or at least some of their strategists felt, that this could be a referendum on the economy. And it didn't even have to be Romney. It could be Obama was just going to lose on the economy and Romney would just step in and win. And it became clear now that, as they frame it, it's going to be a choice election. And so part of that, one of the things they're doing, and I don't know if this would help with women voters, but it's sort of telling the personal side of Mitt Romney. The first time you saw that was it was actually only at, if you were at the convention because their video did not air in prime time, but they had this very moving 10 minute video of Romney playing with his young sons and with his father and people sort of telling the personal side of who Mitt Romney is. And recently on the campaign trail, and again, I don't know enough to know if this would appeal specifically to women voters or to all voters, but he started telling these sort of personal moving stories. He has these three stories basically about people who have died in his life and have touched him. And he tells them, and it's the first time since following Romney for a year that you'll see the crowd kind of hush and people tear up and, you know, it sort of plays on, on people's heartstrings. And I think they're hoping that will appeal to men and women and independents and basically anyone of voting age will get themselves to a poll. And there still is a pretty serious split among people who, th who say that they're independents. Um, Romney still in some polls, in some of these state-specific polls, has a bit of a lead um, against Obama, but those things have been changing a lot as we've seen in the last couple of weeks. I want to move on because we have other ground to get to, and also because we do want to preserve a period for audience question and answers of any of us. Um, but first I wanted to turn a little bit to talking about uh, female candidates from Hillary Clinton herself to how Sigourney Weaver played her on television. I don't know if you saw that, but you know, as secretary, as a very powerful Secretary of State, um, and of course we've had Michelle Obama and Romney out there on the trail, and we had Michelle Bachman in the Republican primaries as, as a female candidate recently, and as I said earlier, we've had female candidates across the country, and in many races right now, or several races, I think there are three Senate races where it's uh, two women uh, vying for the same seat, and there are several congressional races that are the same. So I wanted to talk a little bit to how women candidates are covered differently, first of all. Um, and to that, um, uh, maybe we should go to Susan first to talk about sort of Michelle Bachman and, and the 08 campaign, if you saw a bit of Hillary and Alex as well. Yeah, for the time I spent with Michelle, I would say the standout moment had to be that Newsweek cover that a lot of you might remember, right? It was a very close in unflattering shot and her eyes were <laughs> They were like Google eyes. Cra crazy eyes, I think, was the official campaign term. That was the term. So people had already been calling her crazy eyes, and this just reinforced that image, right? And the, the headline was Queen of Rage. Even though if you read the article, the word rage never came up. And in her defense, she wasn't the kind of woman who went off in angry rants. And she was very controlled. And I think she did that because she was very much aware of how she was going to be scrutinized. She saw what happened to Hillary, she saw what happened to Elizabeth Dole in 99, and she was super concerned about her image. I mean, there's one anecdote where she wouldn't let a photographer take a picture of her in cargo pants on the campaign plane. You know, she would, uh, during commercial breaks, go to freshen up her makeup, um, something the men didn't have to do, but that she thought was important. And what was wrong with the cargo pants? She just didn't want to appear that casual. She was trying to set a certain image that looked presidential. And it's a good question. I don't think there's a consensus, maybe on TV, but in reality, of what a presidential woman looks like, right? It's so easy for a man 
you throw on that dark suit and the red tie, and if you've got a little gray, even better, and boom, you're presidential. But what does a woman do? And I think she was trying to write those rules for herself. Yeah, there was another moment, though, that I thought was really important, and that was when Michelle Bachman was on Fox News uh, Sunday. And Chris Wallace, the host, turned to her and asked her the following question. Are you a flake? Now, the last I looked, she was not the candidate in the Republican field who was proposing colonies on the moon. <laughs> um, and I, I, this moment came, the, the moment though came back to me because I was at a candidate training school for women candidates at Rutgers. They have a wonderful thing called the Center for American Women in Politics. And they played that moment for all these women who were thinking of running for office. And Chris Wallace asked that question, and there is just this <coughs> gasp across the room. But it was the clear message was, if you're a woman running for office, be ready for this. Also, I, I, there was a moment in the debate where she was asked if she'd serve her husband, I believe. I mean, the, the idea, I, to, but to the idea of what a sort of female president looks like. I mean, Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, I think has upended a lot of expectations about how you need to be in, and, and to some degree how you need to look. I mean, I think we all remember that series of, or maybe I don't know, some of us remember that series of tweets that came out, photos, or it was like a meme on the internet, photos of Hillary Clinton wearing dark glasses texting, and it became an internet sensation. And she's, you know, unafraid of looking like she's traveling around the world and doesn't have time for hair and makeup. And I think that that's been, on some level, really empowering to see on the public stage. But I think she, she, she got that way. It didn't start that way. Um, I, you know, I ran for Congress in 2010, and I absolutely faced this. Um, very early on in my campaign, I was getting interviewed by the New York Observer, and she wanted to meet me on a Sunday. And I was a totally untrained candidate, so I threw on my summer dress and put my hair in a ponytail and met her with my flip-flops, because uh, I didn't know any better. And of course, she wrote a story about my flip-flops and my sunglasses and my sundress. And uh, so, of course, both of my, my two consultants who were women, you know, sat me down for a talk, right? Uh, for for Dolce Cabana Gate, as we call it. And said, you know, <laughs> and said, all right, you know, from here on out, you have to wear the, the suit, right? The, the, the J. Crew button down, the glasses, the ponytail, and the theory box suit, right? You know, so throughout the campaign, gained 10, 15 pounds that I'd never seen my body before. And just psychologically, right? Getting up in the morning, going on defense, it really messed with my confidence level. And I remember um, four weeks before the campaign, before the election, great summer day, got that wonderful call from the New York Times saying that Susan uh, Dominus was actually gonna spend the day with me. And I was in such a good mood that I threw on this really great red dress, right? We spent the whole day in Queens talking about issues, and you know, she looked down at my feet at the end of the interview and she said, wow, you know, how did you make it in these, I'm not wearing the shape, but uh, in these four inch wedges that I had on? And I said, and I made some cute remark and said, oh, these are the politician woman's shoes. And sure enough, the next morning she called me up and she said, what's your shoe size? And you know, she wrote a story. And, and, and as she wrote the story, she said, you know, I can't believe I'm writing this story, but she wrote a story about young women running for office and, and, and what we wear. And I remember that moment, and, and, and you know, Kate Spike still sends me shoes now every week, so it's, 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 it, there's some benefit from it. But I remember being really angry about that story in the beginning, but then when I looked back and I thought about it, I was so happy that she wrote it. Because it taught me a big lesson about authenticity. So now it's like I throw on the red dress every day, right? Because you have to look and dress like who you are. And if that's the glasses and the boxy suit, great. If that's that really fun, conservative dress, that's great too, because I think there is a different generation right now, right? And I think what we've learned is like, they're gonna go there anyway. So why not like wear what you want and still be taken seriously? Well, I, I have a funny Hillary story though, that on her campaign plane four years ago, the photographers, the, the news photographers notice everything because that's their job. So they began to realize that Hillary Clinton had her suits in a rotation so that you could predict weeks in advance which color suit she was going to be wearing on a given day. So back on the bathroom, in the back of the plane, the photographers gleefully 
posted an entire calendar for the next month <laughs> of every suit that Hillary Clinton was going to wear. So one day, Hillary Clinton herself wanders back in the plane and sees this calendar and she begins to laugh until she looks down at herself. And sure enough, she is wearing the suit that the photographers had predicted weeks before she would be wearing that day. And, and did you change? Back? No, she did not. So. Just to go back even further. Well, she, and by the way, she called her campaign the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pantsuits. <laughs> Just to go back even further, if you remember, or maybe you don't because you're too young to remember, but when she, when her husband was running for the very first time for president, everything from the way she wore her hair to her hair bands, her ugly hair bands, to her little, you know, button-up uh, uh, blouses were made fun of. But one of the biggest things was, and this was still haunting her, eight years later, post-impeachment, she decides to run for the Senate. Nobody likes Hillary's legs. She's got, as one person said to me, the worst pair of wheels, you know. <laughs> so she started wearing pantsuits all the time. And she made fun of herself, actually, at a roast in Albany um, while she was running. And she had on a beautiful yellow suit that night that did have pants. But she pulled up, she was also accused of being a carpetbagger, because remember, she was running from New York, where she really hadn't lived before. She pulls up a big carpet bag onto the podium and starts pulling out one black pantsuit after the other. <laughs> like just three of them in a row, just to poke fun of herself. But she had been criticized so much for every single thing that she wore. And I think now when she shows, right now she's not running for office. Who knows, 2016, there are all these rumors. But, so she's kind of comfortable running around the world with her hair pulled back and sort of a straight ponytail, not worrying about, you know, little turkey neck or what have you. I mean, she's she's more comfortable with herself, but she's also sort of not, you know, she's not getting as much criticism for what she wears today because of sort of the position that she has. She's a little more insulated, I would say. But can I say, when you look at the, the kind of women who are the future of women going into politics, the successful lawyers, the prominent teachers, the community activists, you know, Hillary Clinton talked about all those cracks in the glass ceiling that she had made. And, you know, Sarah Palin also, after they lost, said, look, you know what, we did something historic here, and this isn't going to be the first anymore. Well, there's a, a professor at American University named Jennifer Wallace who did a big study about four or five months ago where she surveyed people around the country who would be potential candidates of the future because they're successful, they're smart, they're educated, they're prominent. And it was amazing the number of women, young women, who looked at Hillary Clinton and who looked at Sarah Palin and said, not me. I'm, I'm supposed to give up my successful, you know, partner track job at this law firm to go out there and go through that. And it was really pretty shocking to me that you know, in some ways, the trail that they have blazed for younger women who have other options have been a real cautionary tale. And why the number of women in Congress in the 2010 election, for the first time in 30 years, the number of women in the House went down, not up. Uh, the number of women in the Senate has plateaued. The number of women running for governor this year is down. And in some ways, it is because of these things that, you know, women just can't get past. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think it, what we've learned is you got to have really thick skin to run for office. You know, I stopped reading the comment section of the blog. You know, my poor father, like, you know, got the internet at home just so he could, like, be one of those people defending me on there. So I think, though, but I do think that there's a sentiment out there that there's this powerful sisterhood, right? I mean, you have to remember, like, women, we Facebook more, we tweet more, we blog more. We have the power to actually really protect each other, right, and to stand up for one another. And you really saw that with the Susan Cohen thing and, and, and Todd Aiken. And so I think that, you know, I know for me now, when I see my, you know, my, my sisters running for office, I, I do that, right? And I encourage other young women to do that as well. Because we can't let that be a deterrent. Because it's always going to be out there, and we're always going to have, you know, we're always going to be judged on what we look like, what we said, what we didn't say. And if that's a reason for us to not run, then we can't, we can't be blamed if only 16% of Congress is women. But let's shift that discussion. That brings up an interesting point. Please, everyone, jump in because all of you have different experiences with this. 
I mean, we live in this land of, you know, Twitter all the time, 24-7 blogs, people commenting. I mean, Hillary's frankly a uh, loyal mob. I forget what we used to call them, Puma, right? The, the people who wanted her to, to, like, keep running. Yeah, the party unity. Um, you know, they would, I used to uh, run our, our politics blog and um, often would moderate comments as well. And if you had, you know, the Obama versus Hillary primary thing going, which we did for months and months on end, I mean, you know, the Hillary people would swarm in and mod the blog, and then the Obama people would bat it back, and they'd be tearing at each other online because they were such loyalists to each other. And it's, it's only intensified because Twitter is so much more a part of the campaigns, it's so much more a part of our journalistic lives, and it's, I mean, it's, it's so much more of a communications tool anytime there's a disaster or there's a news event, people are automatically going to Twitter to try to communicate and to put up news as we've seen through the Arab Spring. So Alex, you go first. How has Twitter affected your journalistic life? How do you use it on your show? And how do other people communicate with you? Uh, I mean, it goes with that. Twitter is where, in terms of the news media cycle, it's the, my, my first destination in terms of just keeping up with articles that have been published, you know, uh, reporting. It's, it's hugely, hugely useful. It's also exhausting. Um, uh, you know, in terms of the show, we've incorporated what we call a Twicker at the bottom of the screen, which has, which is constantly rotating and is, I mean, it goes through a screening process, but we'll have, we'll showcase tweets that have to do with whatever it is that we're talking about, or tweets from folks that are on the panel, or tweets about folks that are on the panel, as long as they're not nasty tweets. Um, it's, it, I mean, Twitter is an incredible innovation. I think, you know, being in the public sphere, it's also, you know, has some degree of double-edged sordidness to it insofar as you're really out there and vulnerable in a way that you wouldn't be in another age. Um, I would also say being a woman out there in the news media, everybody can probably agree with this, being a woman in the world, um, you're subject to a different set of standards and uh, comments, and especially being in the news industry where there are not that many women, and being in the television news industry, and being a young woman in that industry, uh, the Twitterverse can be vicious. So my executive producer who's here tonight has put a kibosh on me looking at my comments on certain days, although I, 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 I break that ban many times and they can tell and they can see a frown descending, it's gloom descending <laughs> on my face and they're like, you're looking at the comments section, aren't you? Um, but for the most part, you know, it, it is an incredible community and there's a real robust exchange of ideas and I think the, the, the saddest, hardest part for me in terms of having to ignore certain corners of the Twitterverse is that there are people that are watching the show or people that are writing things that have really substantive, interesting points to make and sometimes that gets lost in the churn. But overall, I mean, Twitter is been a, a revolutionizing tool in terms of me and our show and I would say uh, the news industry on the whole. Susan? Well, it's made it a little bit harder to do the kind of reporting that I like, which I'll call fly on the wall reporting, the incredibly public aspect of everything that we do and that your face is out there, whether you're on TV or not, everybody knows what you look like, they can post on your wall, they can respond to your tweets, and it's taken away some of the privacy and I think then some of the autonomy. Uh, um, and when I was covering Herman Cain, for instance, God forbid he sneezed and we didn't know about it <laughs> to tweet something out. So it's definitely um, revved up the metabolism of the media. So were those Herman Cain supporters or the campaign itself that was watching you? I'm watching your tweets. Right, the campaign. Uh, making sure that you didn't miss this and you didn't miss that. Well, I'm well aware of that, but that's where our news judgment comes in, right? right? So we're not going to necessarily tweet every single thing that happens, although they want us to, as long as it was in their benefit. So if my brain is an animal, you actually wrote about how the campaigns are monitoring like reporters' tweets and, and the coverage tweets. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, and I think this is the Romney campaign a bit more than the Obama campaign, but one of the most fascinating things for me was I would be working on a story and I would email the Romney campaign and it's a, you know, A1 story, no one would get back to me. It would be maybe a story that wasn't that flattering. I wouldn't hear a word. I would send out a tweet and people would go crazy. I would have advisors emailing me and yelling at me and asking for tweet corrections and was that tweet exactly fair? And so I realized this was a thing and in talking to them I found out that the Romney campaign, they do two things. One is whenever there is a, an event, they have people who are monitoring all of the tweets from reporters who cover them and they compile it all and they send it out to their word, which is this basically everyone on staff. And the reason they do that 
is, and they also now, I've learned, they've started sending out individual tweets to their war room, because um, we're getting pushback on that, but the reason they do that is because in watching these Twitter streams in real time, they can see, for instance, a point Romney's making that's, that's effective, that you know, it looks like all the reporters are seizing on, or they can see that reporters notice, for instance, that there were no women standing behind Romney in an event. That's something we would all tweet about. That's something we all have tweeted about. And then they know we're going to be getting questions on this, we're going to be getting articles on this, and they can sort of start to push back against a story that doesn't even exist. So before you've written a word, you have the Romney campaign you know, coming up to you and tapping you on the shoulder and saying, we invited women, they just didn't show up, that's not our fault. And so it's this crazy back channel. And the final point I would make is because we've learned, the reporters have learned that the campaign responds so effectively to Twitter like nothing else. A story I think of is my friend Mae Reston from the LA Times. She was in a hardware store waiting for Romney to come by and an advanced staffer told her she couldn't be there and he was going to arrest her, which was not really in his, his right. Um, and so she started arguing back and forth with, you, you know, you can't arrest me, sir, like you're 23 and I don't even think you have a badge, but then she realized she sent out a tweet. In terms of uh, politics, and I think that many of you probably know this, the inner circles around the candidates are largely, if not solely male, um, there might be one or two women who are, as Valerie Jarrett, I guess you could say at the White House, might be the most prominent woman uh, in that circle. And in, in the media coverage circles, and Alex, you started to point this out, there are a, a lot of the decision making and a lot of the, uh, the, the, the core coverage is written by men. And I, there's a women's media center that pointed out, I think a few months ago, that 70% of the bylines covering the campaign at that point uh, were male bylines, and that would be newspapers. And, um, but there's also a lot of sort of primetime coverage by men, and as you can see, there was this kerfuffle over who would be a moderator for the debates, and the woman, uh, you know, Raddatz is doing one, and, and she's doing vice presidential debate, and not the presidential debates, and Candy Crowley, the other woman, is getting the town hall debate, so it's not, I mean, maybe in light of how Jim Lehrer got criticized, it's not a good thing to be a moderator, but, you know, aside from that, there, there aren't a lot of women who are really in sort of like the key prominent positions covering the campaign. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask uh, each, each of you sort of like in your experience, um, you know, why do you think there are so few women who are journalists covering campaigns? Do women step off the track, you know, uh, to, to have families and then decide that being on the road is too difficult? to have a personal life? <laughs> so, so I'm sure can answer that question. So why don't we start with you, Ashley, and go around. Uh, well, one thing that's somewhat interesting is that has not totally been my experience. When I'm sitting in often politics meetings at the Times, I'll sometimes look around and realize I'm one of three women in this room, and the other two women are on stage right now. But in, on the Romney campaign bus, actually, and it's just, it seems to be by happenstance, it's an almost all-female press corps. Um, it's of, of the networks that cover, there's five networks, there's only one one guy, and Fox has a guy and a girl who trade off, um, but then three other women and other print, so it's a very female heavy press corps. So I guess in that sense, it's a bunch of girls, it's literally a bunch of girls on the bus. And are most of them younger at this point, your age? And yeah, so I'm 30, and I would say there's a few older than me, but it's a, a little younger. I mean, I guess the one interesting thing, in, whatever, none of us, um, one of us is married, but the rest of us are covering the campaign because we're sort of in the point of our lives where we don't have any real responsibilities like children or, I, I don't even know what else would be a real responsibility. That's how far removed I am from a real responsibility. But we can all pick up and leave and, and cover this campaign. But what's interesting is when we're all talking about, we, whatever, Romney has not won or lost yet, but we're all talking about 2016 and we cannot wait to cover 2016. And one thing that's interesting on the bus among some of the older female reporters is people are talking about well, like, how would I do it if I have a kid? Or like if I cover the next election, I'd literally have to get pregnant on election night. Like, so that is a concern that comes up. I, I had two election year babies. Um, and let me tell you though, once you've done it a time or two, you begin to realize, <laughs> the babies and the campaigns, that the bus is not the place. The bus is fun. It's this wild experience. It is not the place where you get to really know the candidate. I flew around Iowa with Mitt Romney for a day and a half, just me and him and Eric Fernstrom and Tag in a plane for a day and a half in 2007. And that 
experience taught me more about Mitt Romney than anything I've seen on that campaign. The, I mean, those are the, you begin to realize that the kind of constant shovel of the logistics of just having to get out a story on the campaign speech every day becomes a lot less satisfying as you get older. And the, the other thing is, you do start wondering, is this worth, I remember my first campaign listening to a network correspondent, mother of four, on the phone right before election day with one of her kids, and that, then it was a cell phone, but it was like this big, <laughs> saying, I know, honey, I know, I said, I'd be home to see your Halloween costumes, and I'm sorry that you were not going to be there. And I thought for a moment, and I thought, wait, you're missing this? to cover Lloyd Benson? <laughs> you know, um, a guy who doesn't have a ghost of a chance of getting elected vice president of the United States. So again, you do start of start looking at that too. You begin to realize there are some things that are really meaningful uses of your time, and there are other things that being one of 15 people sitting in a filing room writing the exact same story that everybody else is writing from the exact same speech, which is the exact same speech you wrote about three times yesterday, becomes, you know, again, after you've done it a few times, it's not so thrilling. Gee, no, I was just going to be really excited to go out there again. <laughs> different from candidate to candidate uh, these days too. I mean, if you were on the bus in 08 with McCain, when he used to come, you know, and have those, it was really great to be a reporter on some of those buses. I took buses. my kids on the bus with McCain. The reporters were so sick of listening to McCain that McCain at one point spent much of an afternoon just entertaining my kids. <laughs> no, but anyway, I'm sorry. Go on. Go to my left. The rest of my people want to go next. Um, I, I guess I've just been thinking a lot about, like, how do you change these networks, right? How do you change these circles? Um, and I know as a candidate, when you think about who you're hiring, there just aren't a lot of women who are pollsters right who are consultants who are who are in part of the team of folks that you can really hire but I do think that like for me I make a concerted effort to really find those women um, secondly it's like look I have this model that uh, you know you should pick a successor that's a woman right every opportunity I'm obsessed with women and every opportunity that I have I hire women right when I look at my girls who co team they're all women my campaign team all women right I very much kind of ascribe to the Hillary Clinton model of leadership, where she really surrounds herself around really smart, powerful women. And I think if we're going to really change the glass ceiling and kind of break through these opportunities, it's up to us, right, as women, and, and when we have power over making hiring decisions. Susan? If you look at the, the way the candidates' wives were used at the conventions, um, they were there to show the softer side, to convince us that these human beings were actually human, because they needed to be humanized. And I think if we had more women on the inside, perhaps at this point, we'd already know that they're human, you know? And what a role for those two particular women. And you look at Michelle Obama with her Ivy League degrees. It was sort of a reductive role. Like maybe there were stories that she would have rather told than, you know, the silly ones about their first dates and whatnot. So I think there are ripple effects of this that go beyond the candidates, the candidates' families, to how we how little girls look up to these women and what they think the role of first lady is and and that the female candidates. I don't travel with um, a candidate right now on a bus or a plane, so I'm pretty much a solo <laughs> practitioner. I, um, I cover the campaign, but from the edges. Um, so my experience is, I guess, I, as a woman on the road, I deal with some of the solo safety issues that I think anyone would deal with. Um, arriving to a hotel room uh, late after rallies and finding someone already there, you know, uninvited, <laughs> um, or going to debate watch with someone and being told it's going to be a party and we're going to watch it together and you show up on the sketchy side of the moine. <laughs> and well, Susan, you're getting invites and I don't think anybody else is. I'm not getting those invites, but it's on the road with Susan. So, and the point was to live blog, you know, the debate. And it's a man who opens the door and then shuts it behind me. So we're going to have a great time watching the debates tonight. And I'm thinking, no, I'm going to be calling 911 before we have a great time watching this debate. Um, so just things like that, you know, 
Yeah. I remember one time in Dubuque, John uh, Kerry's campaign dropped us off in a hotel where the front desk was behind a bulletproof. <laughs> <laughs> there was another hotel, hotel in Florence, South Carolina, where they had Twinkies on the breakfast buffet. Oh Some of us wouldn't mind them. Yeah, I was going to say that. That doesn't sound so bad. Uh, I think there are like three different threads to pick up, but um, to Reshma's point, you know, I think, especially in media, the thing that I am learning and that I, the lesson that I hope to take with me is having female mentors and being very cognizant of being, you know, at a certain point in your career and nurturing other women and also the way women treat each other in especially the hyper-competitive um, environment in which we all work it, it is, is, you know, it, sometimes women are not, there. That, you know, there is, there is not a sisterhood of the, of the traveling pants or any other kind of <laughs> Sisterhood, and I think being cognizant of that is like something I try and hope, cherish every day. Um, you know, and my executive producer is a woman, and I'm very, we're very proud of that. And you know, we have men on our team too. I think we both relish the fact that we run the show and the boys are beneath us. Um, but that's not, I mean, you know, that's not, that's not a choice to say that women, women are sort of the head of the, the top of the pyramid, and men are sort of building it. And I, I think more, more than anything, it's being cognizant of sort of the gender dynamics at play, and not just between men and women, but between women and women. Good point. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions now. I'm sorry if you've all been really patient. And I think I have to share my microphone, so let me get my ancient legs up. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you uh, for this very informative and uh, entertaining panel. So two things. First is I want to pick up what you, have, you said about Michelle Obama's role in, um, uh, in the uh, convention, thank you. And, uh, you know, I agree, you know, I think that it was very productive. I think that, you know, she should have said more about, you know, policy and, and, and you know, a little bit less of, you know, okay. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody ever did a, a count of how many times she used the word I'm a mother or I'm a mom, but I really thought it sort of, took us back as women a little because, you know, I'm a mom, but I wear many hats. And um, I wanted to know what you thought sort of of the role that women and that the two first lady candidates are playing when it gets down to the local level and how that's, how, how sort of this is really uh, changing local elections this year. Perfect. I haven't spent much time on the local level with them this year. I did with Michelle Obama in 08. And she was a very, she wasn't that woman at the convention. She was talking policy, she was giving fantastic hard-hitting speeches. Um, you know, another thing about the convention that I thought was a missed opportunity, what about all the women out there who aren't moms? You know, there was a very narrow definition of, of who they were reaching out to, and it was the mommy crowd, but... But, but, I, exactly. I, think, but I think that the American public does not want the first lady involved in policy. They don't elect the first lady. Going all the way back to Rosalind Carter sitting in on cabinet meetings. Um, right. And it's, you know, Hillary Clinton did take over a chunk of policy in her husband's administration, and that sure worked out well. I think that, you know, if she's not on the ballot, um, there is a certain kind of circumscribed area that is the electorate's comfort zone where a first lady is concerned. And I think Michelle Obama has handled it beautifully, given the, um, especially all of the other stuff that she had on her shoulder in terms of, you know, setting history and making people, you know, look at the, the first, first lady in our country's history who wasn't white, um, who came from a different background than a lot of people usually associate with that. And it was that she was able to make the American public as comfortable with her as she has and has become probably the most revered figure, I think, in public life today is an extraordinary achievement. 70% approval rating. Is that something that we should be celebrating or almost crying about? I, right? do, in, I, in do, not, I do not want the husband 
of the first woman president to be setting policy either. And I, I guess my question is, yeah, we're sorry. not talking about setting policy, but just showing an awareness that goes beyond. Or, or could she work? It, 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 could, you have Michelle, could Michelle Obama have kept her job? Right. It, it, but and that's she, more she, the point. But, she, but does it just stop with the first lady? I mean, there's a story on, in the Times about Linda McMahon, right, and how she's kind of shifted her perception away from being this businesswoman to be talking about how she met her first husband and being softer and really really not showcasing the professionalism of who she is and showcasing I think the if other she, side. I think if she were coming from some other industry, yeah. uh, that when you're coming from world, when you're coming from wrestling and there is a thousand tapes of YouTube of you in the ring, body yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think she needs no, to but, I mean, but I mean, Meg Whitman, I mean, a lot, I think, again, I, I don't know the answer to this, and I don't know what, what the polling data shows, and I'm curious about that, but I do hope that we get, we, we are at a place soon where you can act, because I have this conversation with lots of young women, and I, I struggle with this. Like, can you be this ambitious woman, right, and be really honest about that, um, and still be, quote, liked, or, you know, still be electable? And, and it's the same template for the first lady's rule since Mamie Eisenhower, maybe even before look, that. It's time to modernize that image. So like, I would, you know, there were, what, three or four women elected governors in the midterms last time, all of them Republicans. All of them accomplished women, um, and I, you know, I think that where you need to be looking is at this crop of women governors because they are actually running states, and they are, I think, all in all, a pretty impressive bunch of people. Next, someone the mic. So. Please answer either the short question or the longer one. I mean, my, my question won't be long, but the potential answer is. Uh, so first, watching the McCaskill race and the uh, Elizabeth Brown race, uh, those two races, uh, is, is there some, I don't see a female component specifically to the likely outcome, but I wonder if anybody does and, and how, you, how you're marking the race. But then beyond that, we didn't get to talk about the overall state of congressional female candidates. So if anyone has a, a way to wrap up what you, your view of what we can expect as an outcome and how the role of women as candidates is playing out in this election, appreciate it. Well, there are more women candidates for the House and Senate than there have ever been, and there are vastly fewer women candidates for governor than we've seen in the last few cycles. But one of my favorite question in the most recent um, debate in Massachusetts was where Elizabeth Warren, who, by the way, she's not trimming her, you know, professional ambitions, and you know, her husband just made his first appearance on the campaign trail quite recently. Um, but they asked her in the debate. They said, "Why has Massachusetts never elected a woman senator or governor?" And her answer was perfect. She said, "I don't know, but I'm trying to change that." I mean, I wish I could predict the future as far as the congressional races. I think the uh, the Aiken McCaskill race has been largely, I mean, McC McCaskill's candidacy has been uh, hugely helped by the fact that Todd Aiken decided to weigh in on forcible and legitimate rape. Uh, and and you know, Claire McCaskill's a fighter, um, and and played that hand incredibly well, literally waiting until the, the, the first minute that Todd Aiken was actually officially on the ticket and there was nothing the Republican Party could do to then attack him because she knew he was such a weakened guy. She was He was her preferred opponent. I mean, she's played that race incredibly well, but as far as how it ends up shaking out, I can't tell you how much, I mean, I, I, I can't read the TVs on that. Except some Republicans who abandoned him in this, you know, in this difficult period are now sort of weighing whether to get back in and finance, you know, the end run because they've seen some not great polls, but some tightening of that race. She had a very difficult time getting elected in the first place in that state, and she made a point of talking about how she would go to a lot of rural areas and try to coerce people who would not vote Democrat to vote for them the first time around. So it's not surprising that she might be having a tough time anyway, but it's still, you know, it's really, really tight here. So Aiken may not suffer, no matter how little he knows about the women's body. <laughs> I know we covered this earlier, I walked in a little late, but um, if any of you fans were this, uh, how do we get back to the country? 
not to uh, the place where we actually elect officials, leaders, to based on um, character and values as opposed to based on how much money and how much TV time they have. Uh, and what do you see? And, and do you, you're out there, so I'm asking you, do you see some, some things changing? I'm on a ray of light. <laughs> I mean, I don't really see it changing. One of, I mean, one of the reasons is, for instance, Romney has, up until recently, he's had this really slow schedule that was dictated by fundraising. And we wrote about it, and Romney would have, it wasn't that he wasn't working hard or he wasn't busy, but he would have one public event because he was doing two or three fundraisers a day, and he was having to fly to states where the money uh, is, which are not states that have, you know, independent voters, so he's in, New York or Texas or California and his campaign hated it and he would have this so I guess my point is his campaign was not happy with this they would love they, they claim they would love to go back to the public financing system but I think what they would really like is to have a ton of money and somehow be able to campaign full-time but it's really made it hard for these candidates to go out and meet voters when they're so beholden to, to raising money and they didn't seem to have an answer other than to kind of complain and I don't think given the makeup of the Supreme Court and even if it changes by one justice or two, that they're going to like restore, you know, make the, the original McCain Feingold. I don't. Congress is not going to do it either. It's very unpopular. So the Citizens United ruling and the subsequent one, our previous one, which allowed you know a lot of unregulated money to come back in, um, is going to stand. It's not going to change. I mean, it is really amazing, sort of, how much money uh, you know a few donors have pumped in this this time around. Uh, it's, it's, it's really been startling, and this is the first cycle that we've seen it. And I think for women and minority candidates, it's especially devastating. I mean, you cannot run for Congress unless you have a sugar daddy or a sugar mommy, right? And, and that is a really sad, sad fact. Um, and so I think it, look, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that's great about New York City, you know, if you run locally, you can opt into public financing. And I mean, I guess we got to find a way to have more of those types of systems because our democracy is, is eroding before our eyes. When I went to this campaign boot camp for women in Rutgers, it was really interesting to sit in the sessions about fundraising because they also, a lot of women that's just kind of out of their comfort zone is asking people for money. And they really were telling these women who were thinking about running, you're going to have to get over this. We have time for one more question. <coughs> Hi, uh, this is a question for each of you, the same question. If the election were held tomorrow, who would win and why? Uh, I, you know, is anyone taping this? I, I, look, I think Romney has done, it's been a good, it's been a good week for Mitt Romney. Um, but at the end of the day, I think I'm, you know, I look at the same stuff Nate Silver looks at, although with far less intelligence. Uh, I think that the president wins this just because, you know, if, if there were three more months left in the election, I think Mitt Romney could really, it would, it would be much more of a question. I mean, it's still a question, but uh, they've sort of just figured out what he needs to do 28 days before November 6th. The president has been running a very focused strategy there. You cannot underestimate their ground game, their digital outreach, their, their network building. Um, enthusiasm is definitely a part of it, and nothing's over to the fat lady's things. But at the end of the day, I, I just think the discipline of that campaign is one of the finest in modern political history. So for that reason, if not the message and the fact that people are willing to give him a chance and stay with him for more, four more years, I think he wins up. I didn't really ask supposed to make predictions, so <laughs> I'm not, but I would say that one strong debate performance doesn't win an election, and looking at our models and polls, I'd have to agree with a lot of what Alex said, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, I think the president wins. I think that they made a massive strategic mistake, uh, in, the Republicans did in their policies on women, and I think that they're going to pay heavily for that. <laughs> Start as smart out again and say, Well, the election won't be held tomorrow. And then I remember the election is being held right now. The election in a lot of states started a week and a half ago. And that's one thing that really is sort of more interesting. It's really interesting because so many 
votes have already been cast and they've already been banked. And if in the end, this is a field goal election and not a touchdown election, if it's you win by just a few yards, um, you know, the Obama people do have that advantage of what most people believe is a superior ground operation and the experience at it. But if something happens between now and election day that blows this open, th that's not going to do it. Um, I think I'm not going to make a prediction, but the one thing I will say is the Times and a lot of other places have a very good map, like an app, app of an election map, which is really fun. And so the Times has one where it has the states that are strongly Democratic on one side, strongly Republican, and then the states that are for grabs, and you can kind of go and pick your own map and put, well, if you put New Hampshire here, what does who have to win? And just in looking at that, it feels like Romney has a much tougher map. So when you play around with that, if you put, for instance, Florida in Obama's column, all he has to win is New Hampshire with four electoral votes to win the presidency. Basically the same with Ohio or almost Virginia. And when you look at Romney, I mean, for Romney to win, when I play on the map, I'm sitting there and I have to drag over Florida and then I have to drag over Ohio and I have to <laughs> drag over Colorado and Nevada. So from a map point, I think Romney has to be a bit more perfect than Obama. He has a bit less room for error, but I mean, you could do that. That's the electoral college map she's talking about, for those of you who didn't know that, but I'm sure many, most of you do. And that actually, just to augment that point, what's really fascinating and what's happening in this election and happened, I think, in the last few, the, the, the election is narrowing, and narrowing and narrowing to a few states. And we're lucky in New York, you know, because the candidates come here to fundraise. Um, they don't campaign here, they're not campaigning in New Jersey. You know, because that's also sort of not, you know, a battleground state. There are very few that are left. Uh, of the hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising, it's mainly going to, say, maybe eight states, I'd say. Maybe New Hampshire, uh, North Carolina. Help me out here. Uh, Iowa. Iowa's a big one. Ohio's a big one. Florida's a big one. Nevada, Wisconsin, and Virginia, and Colorado. And But, you know, it keeps sort of narrowing. And, Frankly, Pennsylvania has really been out of the picture. It's not been competitive. Now, we're in this end run where you're going to see a lot of sort of tightening. There were very few undecided to begin with, but some people are making up their minds and shifting, and so the polls will show some tightening in those states too. Whereas before, maybe Obama had been up a lot in San Ohio, you know, it's, it's already coming down. And so we just have to sort of watch and see. And as journalists, we can't make predictions, so whoever's taping this probably should like put that in headlines. So yeah, I didn't make a it. prediction. I just was saying some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> 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 BS, don't get Alex in trouble. Thank you very much for coming.